So the Morning. Morning everyone and morning everyone online as well. Um, we are very um, happy to have Zeb Jamzik come and offer to do journal club this morning. He's a physician at the <coughs> uh, uh, registrar at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. I'm a consultant. He's a consultant. <laughs> he's, he's a physician at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And he's also doing his uh, PhD in this uh, field at Monash University. And it is a particular area that NCAS is interested in. We are looking at ethical issues in aged care as well. So that we're very keen to hear about your thoughts of um, the ethics around AMR. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Cass. And so, yeah, thanks for having me to speak today. Um, I don't know if anyone apart from Tom was at a similar talk I gave uh, at, uh, at FIDS, but I've at least half the slides are new today. Um, I put up this slide at the start just to remind us that if we want to see the future of antimicrobial resistance, all we have to do is look to the world of XDR-TB. Um, and to go forward a slide, I use the keyboard, yeah. Um, and this is a brief a bit of a shameless self-promotion and an advertisement if you'd like to contribute to a book, but um, it's a book I'm editing with my PhD supervisor um, on ethics and antimicrobial resistance in this book series. We've got a number of great um, contributors, including several from Melbourne and Sydney. Um, but the due date is the 1st of July for chapter submissions, so it has to be very quick. Um, AMR is often framed as a, a largely a scientific problem, but I hope I'll convince you there's some interesting ethical aspects and try and flesh some of those out. I'll talk just a little bit about the tragedy of the commons in AMR. Um, but I'm also interested in <clears throat> what duties we might have as just general citizens, but particular, particularly as healthcare workers, not to infect others, particularly to infect others with difficult or impossible to treat infections. And I'll talk a little bit about stewardship. You've all seen this report, the O'Neill report from the UK, showing that if we maintain what we're doing now, things are going to look pretty disastrous um, with uh, over 10 million deaths attributable globally to AMR in 30 years' time. Um, but what's not often mentioned is that <clears throat> to get that number, they only looked at th uh, six uh, infections. Uh, now, clearly TB, malaria and HIV contribute a huge number. But what's interesting is they didn't just look at three bacteria because uh, they were lazy or ran out of money. It's because we don't have any data reliably enough on the other bacteria, which I think is a real, not only a sort of scientific problem, but an ethical problem that we're sort of steering blind for a lot of these bugs, including in, uh, you know, in Melbourne, as full as it is with centres of excellence. And we don't really have a good way of capturing who's transmitting which resistant bugs in the community. Or even if it is captured um, by the labs in this building, uh, it's difficult to communicate that out to people who are going to be seeing that patient next. Um, I like to think of this as a conflict uh, that arises because of two powerful forces. One is the inevitable drive of evolution, selecting out resistant uh, uh, pathogens. And the other is human frailty. So this is Hercules deciding whether to follow the course of pleasure uh, on our right uh, or the course of duty on our left. And when I first made this slide, I was thinking mainly about uh, healthcare workers and doctors that uh, we know what the right thing to do is. Uh, but if you look, to, look at the rate of doctors washing their hands or over-prescribing antibiotics, it's clear that it's sometimes hard to do those things. But we've also got another kind of human frailty, which is just understanding. And people talk about translational research, but if there's, if there's a really urgent translational research project. It's translating the urgency of the problem to the general community. So this is a survey from the Wellcome Trust of a couple of thousand people in the UK in 2015. Most of them had no idea what the survey people were talking about, not only when they said AMR, but even when they talked about resistance. Most people in the community think that when you have a resistant, when you're resistant to antibiotics, that it's your body that's become resistant. And if you haven't used antibiotics in the past, you're not at risk of resistant infection whatsoever. And this is a message that is that everyone in this room understands, but that we're really not getting out into the community. So much so that there was this piece last week in Nature uh, called um, Antibiotic Resistance Has a Language Problem, urging us to use standard terminology and terminology that everyone can understand. In fact, they said we should abandon the term antimicrobial resistance because nobody in the community knows what it means and that we should just talk about drug-resistant infection um, because... Uh, it sort of means the same thing, although it doesn't sound as clever, um, but everyone in the community knows what drug-resistant infection is, even though they don't understand the mechanisms that give rise to it. 
Um, but we also need to revise ethics. <clears throat> so most standard moral theories uh, deal with very simple problems. Standard medical ethics that bores medical students silly uh, says that we should do some good, we should not do harm, uh, we should respect a patient's um, autonomy and freedom, uh, and we should make sure resources are distributed according to a just or fair distribution with a kind of four principles model. The problem is that in things like antimicrobial resistance, well, the treatments give both benefits and harms to the individual patient. Um, we have difficulty distributing the scarce resource of antimicrobials, and there's a clear conflict of autonomy, for example, when we isolate people against their consent. And a lot of people in hospital say, a lot of my patients in hospital, for example, who are in with a, a non-infection related problem like heart failure, and we isolate them because they're carrying a resistant bug. They say to me, oh, why, why do I have to be locked up? Uh, I don't have an infection. And there's again a problem of kind of um, understanding, although we have a very good ethical rationale to isolate people without their consent in order to protect others. Um, they don't always understand that. And so we need to have a sort of ethical theory underlying uh, those kind of practices. <clears throat> so likewise, moral, our moral theories tend to focus on simple sort of problems that might arise in small human tribes. You speared my brother, uh, therefore you owe retribution. That's the kind of basic moral theory that we have. Um, so it tends to focus on individual immediate harms where we're certain about what's going to arise and where there's a clear cause. But most of the really interesting problems that we have to deal with in medicine and in society in general deal with large populations, including the global population, sometimes very distant harms, like when uh, resistant pathogens get imported to Australia by a single individual from the other side of the world. Uh, they deal with risks rather than definite harms and multiple causes and the actions of multiple individuals rather than single simple causes. It's clear that there are many, many mechanisms and many ethical issues uh, in antimicrobial resistance. I'm just going to talk about a couple today mainly. One is that a lot of people appreciate that overuse and underuse of antibiotics can lead to resistance, but I don't think it's as widely appreciated, even really by practicing doctors, that even appropriate use is giving rise to resistance because of all the commensal organisms in the body. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the duties we might have uh, not to infect our patients and the urgent ethical reasons we have to expand surveillance for transmission of resistance in the community. There's a lot of talk about animal uh, and farming sources of resistance um, and I think that uh, while that is a clear pressing policy issue, the one I'd like to focus on is, is in uh, human populations, although it's clear that some of the dynamics are the same. So just as the reason why we have to use antibiotics in farming is because of, uh, animals are stacked like this, the basic problem in humanity is the same. Too many animals stacked too closely together. It's the perfect situation for the transmission of infection. And there's some evidence to suggest that um, in urban centres, there's a greater use of antimicrobials per capita, not just totally, um, at least in some countries. And, uh, and that there's a more close tracking of, for example, the influenza uh, influx each year and the use of antimicrobials. Um, so this idea that each person trying to uh, get a benefit for themselves or their patients brings about a bad situation is sometimes known as the tragedy of the commons. When this is taught um, in places like Oxford, they'd like to talk about the quadrangles in the Oxford colleges, that uh, if everyone is allowed to walk across the grass as they see fit, uh, eventually there'll be no more grass. And so we have to have some kinds of rules about who can walk on it and when. And the different colleges have different rules, actually. Um, some of them have a rule that only senior fellows can walk on the grass. That's kind of like only infectious diseases. Doctors can prescribe certain antibiotics. But in any case, this is a problem that's uh, widespread and was particularly talked about in terms of overpopulation, overfishing um, and climate change, where you can all see how that applies. But it's increasingly being raised in public health contexts, i.e. herd immunity um, and antimicrobial resistance, where the commons would be effective antimicrobials that are gradually being eaten away by uh, appropriate and overuse. And in a famous paper in 1968, uh, Garrett Hardin um, summarised this in one sentence, which is that freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. So although the AMA and other medical bodies like to talk about how doctors should uh, have the autonomy to make decisions about their own patients, it's clear that that writ large in this problem, um, in the absence of perfect diagnostics and uh, a very uh, targeted therapy, will lead to this kind of tragedy. Although there's some caveats that I'll get to um, later. Uh, an, uh, another philosopher, Derek Parfit, summarised it in this way, that this is a situation and this is the kind of general form of the situation where it's certain 
It's not even just probable. It's certain that if each person gives himself an expected benefit, this will either reduce the total expected benefit, i.e. lead to a rise in antimicrobial resistance, or will impose on everyone an expected harm or cost. And this is where we're headed um, with antimicrobial resistance at the moment. Um, so that means that to deal with it, we have to have trade-offs between uh, the health of individuals and potentially even the lives of individuals. Um, Kaz mentioned uh, at end, uh, antibiotic use at end of life, and I'll bring that up a little bit later. But doctors tend to provide, uh, tend to prioritise their individual patients and don't want to give up uh, benefits for the person in front of them, which is very understandable. However, as I mentioned, this goes, to, it goes forward to uh, collective ruin. And we like to tell ourselves uh, through the powerful psychological forces of denial, also raised in the same paper called The Tragedy of the Commons, um, that uh, we're not really the cause of it. And there's some good data to show this. So this is a, a study of um, medical residents in uh, Scotland, in Dundee, and uh, France in Nice. And you can see in the top there that the prevalence rate um, in the hospital was similar to, um, in the brackets, similar to, it was almost exactly the same as the rate in the total of the country as a whole. But then the bottom there in the square, they, and they asked people, is it a national problem? Oh, the residents said, 95% said, yes, it's a national problem. And they said, is it a problem in your hospital? And then only about 60% would say that it's a problem in their hospital, even though it's exactly the same levels. They said, oh, is it a problem, a problem in your clinical practice? And that was even lower in some settings, suggesting that we are, everyone likes to say, oh, my patients are special. Um, but I think fundamentally we're in denial about the, the epidemiology of what we're dealing with. And at Royal Melbourne Hospital, when I ask my residents when they're prescribing an antibiotic, I say, oh, what is the rate of resistant E. coli or resistant Staph aureus in the Royal Melbourne population in general medicine? Nobody knows. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can work on a project to try and get that information to our residents. Um, this shows the same problem in, uh, in, in uh, France and Scotland. So Garrett Hardeman in this, in this paper in Science, like cited 40,000 times, said, uh, there's no technical solution to this problem. Uh, there's only a moral solution, i.e. that we have to legislate temperance, or as he said, mutually agreed upon mutual, mutual coercion, i.e. we all have to agree upon restrictions on how we're going to use antimicrobials. And that's fundamentally an ethical choice. Just in terms of what technical solutions we could have, I don't think anybody who understands this problem thinks that new drugs are going to solve it, even though that's what's spoken about all the time in the media. Um, perhaps if we had really good diagnostic tools where we could get a bedside accurate diagnosis of the resistance profile and then we could have a very targeted drug, then maybe new drugs would help. But on their own, they're not going to fix the, the basic dynamics of the problem and maybe some non-drug agents, but I'm yet to see one that would work. And so we're in a situation now where <clears throat> psychological, professional, legal factors are leading to antimicrobial, uh, or let's just say antibiotic overuse, um, and uh, allowing individual physicians to choose as a major contributor to resistance. So there was some great, uh, great work I saw presented where they talked about um, reducing the use of fluoroquinolones in hospital. And when the lab doesn't, doesn't release the ciprofloxacin sensitivity, when the bug is sensitive to trimethoprim, that automatically decreases the doctor's use of the second line agent. Um, but uh, guidelines are only good uh, so long as they are uh, enforced in some way um, for that kind of reason. And so this is a problem I like to think about. People say, oh, we, th we think we're dealing with staphylococcal sepsis and we're going to prescribe uh, a, a drug for a sensitive staph aureus and vancomycin in cases, MRSA. But if I look back on my career, I've probably prescribed vancomycin hundreds of times, but I've only, I've only dealt with invasive MRSA infection a few times, which tells me that my career number needed to treat is um, probably inappropriately high. And I don't know if anyone in this room can tell me a re can tell me why Australia has the highest rate of VRE and give an explanation that doesn't include the overuse of vancomycin in Australia. And if you can, I'd be very pleased to hear it. But I suspect that we've probably got our social, not, not so much individual, but our social number needed to treat wrong that we're using too much vancomycin in short. But what it means is that if we wanted to shift that down, that means that some patients would have to accept more risk when we're not certain um, what kind of resistance profile we're dealing with. And that means that um, individual determination might not be the best way of solving this, that we need to work out um, what's a socially acceptable level of risk. But that's, so that's it for the tragedy of the commons, but it's a bit more complicated than overfishing, clearly, antimicrobial resistance, because <clears throat> unlike overfishing, where you take one extra fish and then there's less fish available to other people, well, if we uh, overuse antibiotics uh, in one person, uh, then 
that person might transmit that pathogen on in the community. And this is a real gap in our knowledge about resistance from what I can gather. And I've been speaking to um, some uh, experts in surveillance about this. And for many of the bugs, although we understand the basic mechanisms that uh, you can get infected with a resistant organism, then uh, if you don't, most people don't get invasive disease immediately. They're carrying the organism around, um, but we often don't know uh, what the average length of carriage is. Um, in most cases, we don't have a method for decolonization, although there are people trialing fecal transplant for multi-resistant gram negatives, which doesn't seem like it's going to be a popular um, uh, avenue, but it might, may prove to be effective. Um, we uh, <clears throat> don't know a lot about the spontaneous clearance rate uh, for each of these organisms, um, or at the very least, I'm yet to see a review comparing and contrasting it across the, uh, the different important resistant bacteria. Um, we don't really understand uh, long-term asymptomatic carriage or the rate of uh, transmission to others in the community. Um, and at least we do have some understanding about who's at risk of invasive disease. And this is where another ethical issue arises, that although the um, resistance might be spread more or less evenly through the community, some groups are at greatest risk, and some groups are definitely at greatest risk of invasive disease, i.e. people with multiple comorbidities, um, like most of my inpatients. Um, so then one question that arises is, should we screen more people? Should we screen random, apparently healthy people in the community? Should we screen uh, patients? Should we screen healthcare workers? I'd like to do a study, and there were recently some data published in Lancet ID um, on medical students. I'd like to do a longitudinal study starting with medical students in their first year or nursing students in their first year of university and see what um, uh, skin and uh, fecal resistant organisms they're carrying and then screen them longitudinally over time until they've been in the health system for five or ten years and work out how many resistant bugs they're carrying because there are definitely cases out there of uh, the relatives of healthcare workers going to hospital with, for example, invasive MRSA and we can be pretty certain where they got that from. They probably got it from their family member who was colonised, although we just don't have really good data about this. Although there are some great data from New Zealand showing that um, if your pet... Uh, no, if you get MRSA, then eventually your pet gets MRSA where they followed up pets and families longitudinally and showed a, a significant rate of um, intra-family transmission. Um, but anyway, one thing we do is screen people more. Um, in favour of that, uh, we might get a better characterisation of the epidemiology. We might, um, for those individuals, preempt uh, resistant invasive disease and better adjust our number needed to treat according to the actual epidemiology of the patient. But then one of the worries is, what should we do when there's no, um, so when we've got a, we've got a decolonisation measure and we think that it might work at a population level, like in Western Australia they do for MRSA, although perhaps it won't work here given the higher rates. Um, then, uh, but then what do we do when we don't, we don't have any intervention to provide for these people? Are we going to create too much anxiety by identifying them as having resistance? Um, or are we going to lead indeed to anti antibiotic overuse where once someone's identified as but someone carrying resistance um, someone who might not, who might not understand exactly what we're dealing with might use even more antibiotics. And then a question is, well, do healthcare workers have special duties um, to be screened for infection? So again, in WA, they have a policy of um, find, search and destroy or something. So um, healthcare workers who've been working in places other than Western Australia who come back uh, must be screened for MRSA and uh, pretty much must consent to decolonisation. Um, but they don't have that for other resistant organisms. And another question is, well, do travellers have special duties? <clears throat> and we try and remember in hospital to ask people, and when I say duties, I mean ethical duties here. Um, well, we try and remember in hospital to ask people if they've been admitted to an overseas healthcare institution, for example, or been travelling to a level, a place where there's high levels of resistance because we know that's a real um, problematic source of resistant organisms. But, uh, you know, one controversial policy you could institute would be um, screening people who come back from health tourism or whatever, whatever before they're able to access the Australian health system. And that's going to have all sorts of ethical um, implications. Just to talk about um, what the actual uh, chances of um, transmitting uh, resistant organisms to patients. Um, this is a paper from Lancet IT from a few years ago. This idea that we should all do no harm. And just as they've talked about, well, should um, influenza vaccination be obligatory for healthcare workers? The same argument could be given for um, screening and decolonisation of resistant organisms since it's clear that if you are carrying, uh, for example, MRSA, 
Um, even if you try and be diligent with your hand washing, certainly doctors are very bad at it, but um, there's been readily identified transmission between healthcare workers uh, and their patients. And then to make matters more complicated, uh, don't worry too much about this, this is just, just my map of uh, transmission events and where we could have um, ethically relevant interventions. Um, obviously, the ideal thing would be to prevent someone ever getting infected with one of these <coughs> resistant strains because once someone's infected, then we go down a sort of cascade of um, more sort of troublesome interventions. You know, one is, uh, well, if you've been sharing a hospital room with someone who has a resistant organism, then you effectively go into uh, enforced quarantine. Um, if we know you are uh, infected, then we uh, isolate you. And in some cases, you might argue that we could uh, enforce uh, treatment. We're picking up a lot of people who eventually get invasive disease. But as I mentioned, if we want to pick up the real epidemiology of these problems, we'd have to do active surveillance. And that's leading to, you know, more and more reporting, monitoring and tracking of individuals by public health authorities. And that's the kind of thing where we'd want to have a good uh, ethical rationale. So just um, one more topic is antimicrobial stewardship. I looked up the history of stewardship and it actually has a, has a mainly theological history. The idea being that uh, God gave people uh, the earth and uh, so we're supposed to look after it as a limited resource. You can see that in the Google engram of the use of the word stewardship that was mainly used in theological contexts uh, since the 18th century and then only recently has been uh, brought in to use um, to be used for antimicrobial or antibiotic stewardship. Um, but basically the underlying concept is a responsible use of limited resources. And likewise, in that Nature paper last week, they urged uh, us to, just like in this um, forum, to stop thinking about stewardship just as a hospital problem, that it's a um, nationwide global issue and that needs to be addressed not only in, in um, the pointy end institutions. But so in terms of what we could do for stewardship, well, one uh, sort of low-hanging fruit is that we could reduce waste, wasteful or futile use, i.e. Um, stop people prescribing antibiotics for a viral illness, uh, have an early oral switch from intravenous antibiotics and uh, shorten the course to only what's required. But we often pretend that that will be enough for antimicrobial stewardship. And I think in the absence of very good new diagnostics and drugs, we have to accept that that's not going to be enough. That um, there's also going to be cases in which where we are uncertain about the resistance profile or the organism that someone is infected with, um, we're going to have to not prescribe the second line agent immediately unless the person has signs of severe sepsis. And fundamentally that means that some people have to bear more risks so that we have effective antimicrobials for the next generations of people. And if you take seriously the idea that we should conserve this resource for future people, i.e. that future people have rights, well, then that's a pretty strong rationale why we would have to bear more risks now. But that's something that people are understandably uncomfortable with. Um, and I think we need to be explicit about how we're going to handle that. Um, what this is about really is about justice or fairness in the distribution of resources. But <clears throat> people say, oh, we want to have equality. Well, equality of what? Do we want equality of access? Do we want equality of health outcomes? Um, do we want to give some weighting to ensure the worst off are not further disadvantaged? And by that I mean like people having chemotherapy for, I don't know, bone marrow, uh, for um, hematological or uh, solid malignancies, they've got suppressed immune systems, maybe they've got more rights to access uh, lots of antimicrobials because if they were made even worse off than they already were by policies, that would seem to be unjust. But another thing you could argue is that, oh, you could say, well, there's a fair innings that... Uh, once you've got to a certain stage in life, uh, we need to conserve this limited resource for others. And there's an argument you can raise to say that uh, we should use less antibiotics, perhaps not just in the elderly, but in the last year of life. We know we massively overtreat in the last year of life. Um, and that would sort of radically change what we do. Um, Likewise, uh, you know, in this palliative care setting that people are having their last dose of Tazacin about an hour before death, um, probably we could argue that, well, at least in that situation, they're unlikely to transmit it to anyone else because they're not going to be around for much longer. Um, but the overarching kind of policy of, of using uh, these agents too late will lead to sort of greater transmission. I think it's good to consider these so that we can make them explicit, supported by evidence and potentially you know, involved in some kind of community consultation to explain the situation um, and get people to uh, agree on what kind of... Um, uh, uh, policy we're going to pursue. Um, so with that, uh, thanks very much.
Well, I think one of them might be what might be screening of healthcare workers. So, um, and partly as a means not just to have the epidemiology, but to really make it clear to people how important it is for them to wash their hands. <laughs> you know, just to, as a way of enforcing the most simple thing that we're trying to achieve, um, and as a way of getting clear about what the epidemiology is, that would be one area. But another, yeah, go on. I think if you look at some of the work from Kieran Estelle and Alison Holmes for the the screening issue is a vex one because I think there are some, there are a few transmission studies coming out from the UK where there's clear evidence of community to hospital, hospital back to community, um, and so it brings a broader question around screening in general. Yeah. And as you know, just picking one bug is that the right thing to do? Because with plasmid and other mechanisms of distance transfer, we're really it's a very gross kind of hammer to do. Absolutely. So does it, the cost of that, does it justify that? Yeah, I think those are numbers, those are numbers you ultimately have to run to work out uh, whether the cost of surveillance um, justifies the benefits we might achieve. But luckily the cost of surveillance is coming down. Um, but you'd have to choose things where it would be cost effective because otherwise we're just creating information for the sake of it. And this is not just about hospitals, of course. No. So we, there are areas like aged care where perhaps some of those sort of measures might be easier to implement. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zen. Thank you. Is it both of you? Yeah, we're a tag team. So we've got a tag team now, um, and we are going to give you an ECPID update. So those of you who follow our Twitter feed would have seen fabulous tweeting from uh, Nanha, Courtney and Karen during their time, which is enormously grateful for me because I couldn't get there, so I felt like I was there. So first up is Karen Advantage, who is one of our PhD fellows um, doing a PhD in antifungal stewardship. Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to be focusing on the antifungal side of things from, from ECMID in Vienna, which was in Vienna this year. And I just realised this morning that how horrible a tourist I am because I did not take one single photo <laughs> <laughs> apart from inside the lecture theatres of the ECMID hall. Um, oh, terrible. Um, so I apologise for the lack of uh, photographic evidence. <laughs> so I have... Just to um, touch upon a couple of interesting posters that I just wanted to highlight. So firstly, um, in the UK, they've done some work in antifungal stewardship, just looking at um, antifungal stewardship programs in their trusts. And this work came out of um, the came out of Cambridge University Hospital, but it was a, um, a nationwide 50 question survey looking at um, who's doing what in antifungal stewardship. Um, and so they looked at um, whether antifungal stewardship programs, formal or informal, were in place, who was involved and what's in place and what resources are being are required to put um, things in place. And so they had about 47 hospitals respond, which roughly equated to 30% response rate, and it was mainly teaching hospitals and district general hospitals, um, and predominantly microbiologists replied, which sort of reflects what their stewardship programs, um, who's involved in their stewardship programs. So just going through their results, um, five or 11% had um, said that they had a dedicated antifungal stewardship program. Um, most, but then most of them said that they had a, what they called an informal process or um, at least monitoring in place. And they didn't quantify that, but um, 
what they referred to as most. Um, most of the um, people involved in antifungal stewardship were microbiologists, plus or minus uh, an antimicrobial pharmacist. Um, and activities included ward rounds. Um, the antifungal stewardship team were directly involved in invasive fungal um, infection management, so candidemias, they would go and see those patients. And they were at least monitoring and reporting antifungal use to some degree. Um, and they said that um, their clinical, they offered their that their clinical advice was thought to be usually followed in um, roughly three quarters of um, respondents. So the, and the reasons for antifungal stewardship programs in place was mainly due to costs um, and cost save, perceived cost savings that they could implement. Um, but there was also, they, they also said that there was a clinical need, which is nice, um, and they wanted to improve antifungal management. Um, they had anti antifungal guidelines were implemented in roughly three quarters of, um, of respondents, hospitals, and most of the trusts had access or availability to um, fungal biomarkers, which are important from a stewardship perspective, mainly to stop antifungal, empiric antifungal therapy, but they did admit to long turnarounds being one of the, um, the problems with these, um, these tests. Um, and 68% of the trusts had access to triazole um, TDM, um, which leaves a large proportion where they couldn't access TDM at all. Um, so optimising antifungal treatment, at least with triazoles, is limited. Um, and so overall, there are antifungal stewardship programs in place and they've been adopted in the UK. We get to see what's happening in, in Australia, so watch this space. And um, the fungal diagnostics are available, but they're, they're limited by the turnaround time and, and also interpretation by clinicians um, um, with the results and, and how to use those results. Um, and at the moment, their antifungal stewardship resources are limited to who's on board at the, at the local sites. So moving on, um, there was a, um, a poster from out of Munich in Germany looking at um, antifungal treatment in haematology patients and whether there was a need for antifungal stewardship. And they just, this was a, basically a, um, an audit of their antifungal use in two haematology wards over a six month period. They characterized the patient cohort and indications for use of antifungals. And they evaluated appropriateness through um, looking at guideline adherence. And so 8% of patients during this period on these wards were prescribed an antifungal. Um, and this is just a breakdown of the prescribed antifungal agents um, on, during this period um, for the indications. And you can see the, the, by the middle bar um, that the largest proportion were for um, empiric therapy, followed by prophylaxis, largely from posiconazole and some um, targeted therapy. So there's a huge um, amount of prescriptions that are being used empirically still. So looking at divergence from guideline recommendations, roughly a quarter differed um, from guideline recommendations in terms of drug choice, so they're not choosing the right antifungal um, where it's indicated, and 16% differed in terms of dose. So there's some room for improvement. And the majority of the divergence in to, from recommendations from guidelines was in the empiric therapy group, not surprisingly. So um, in terms of antifungal stewardship, they, this was, I guess, a driver for them starting a program or an intervention at their local hospital to improve antifungal choice and dosing. So they've got some clear targets for their antifungal stewardship program. So it's really setting the scene. So that was interesting. And then um, a group out of um, Spain or out of Madrid for the Comic Mycosis Study Group um, presented their data on... Um, the efficacy of a bundle uh, intervention um, for candidemia patients. And so this is just a snapshot of the, of the candidemia bundle that they implemented in their candidemic patients. Um, but I have to stress that this is combined with um, bed, that bedside reviews with an antifungal expert. So it's possibly um, driven by having that expert on hand to guide therapy and, and 
and make sure some tests are done. But even despite that, the compliance with all the bundle components were about was about 50%. So only at half the time did were they able to tick all of these boxes. Despite that <laughs> compliance, um, they were able to reduce attributable mortality or 14-day mortality um, in their candidate patient group. Um, and that was largely probably due to improved, what they call improved early adequate antifungal therapy. Um, so, and so, that, so that's something um, I'm waiting for that paper to come out, so that'll be interesting. I also went along to the Invasive Candidiasis in 2017 symposium, and there were a couple of things um, of interest. So, um, so the case of candidate, candidate or Oris um, has the fungal superbug arrived, was um, part of a presentation by um, Mario Fernandez Ruiz from Madrid, and he presented on general trends in, in candida infection epidemiology, but specifically about candida auris. He showed this little graph of um, the year of Canada Aurus. So 2017 is looking to be the year of Canada Aurus in terms of publications at least. Um, and so and he presented this distribution of where the case reports and case series and epidemiological studies are coming out of. So most continents are represented. Australia is absent, however. So um, probably watch this space. We've still got a lot of 2017 to go. Um, but what we know about um, clinic, these uh, clinical infections from this organism um, so far are that um, there, there are no clinical patient, specific clinical patient characteristics to help predict when we're going to see Candida auris. Unfortunately, they're, it's, they're very similar cohort to other Candida species. So there's no clue there. Um, it's very highly transmissible and results in hospital-associated infection. So it kind of behaves like MRSA, which is a little bit alarming. Um, and um, the mortality is high, and that's probably because um, the multidrug-resistant profile um, is a little bit alarming, um, with approximately 41% resistant to two or more antifungal classes. Um, so that sort of leads into, you know, not not optimal, no optimal um, antifungal prescribing, at least in the initial phase of a candidemic episode. So um, hence the high mortality. Um, so Jean-Francois Timzet also presented on when and where antifungal de-escalation is uh, possible and safe. Um, and the bottom line is this is pretty hard because there's a vicious cycle. So there are new antifungal agents that are out kind of candens that are safe and effective, but the mortality remains fairly high. And that's probably because empiric antifungal use is increasing and it also increases the proportion of resistant strains that are um, circulating um, and causing um, uh, invasive candid candidiasis. And there's a reluctance to stop empirical therapy once it's started because the diagnosis is difficult and it's, um, there's, there's no reassurance um, if tests haven't been done before treatment starts to, um, to safely stop things. But it is possible. So he spoke about his rules for um, when to de-escalate in terms of IV to oral switch and, and in terms of stopping um, empiric antifungal therapy. But these are, you know, it's not rocket science. <laughs> Performing all diagnostic tests before therapy starts is vital, but we know that. Um, and sampling from the site of infection will help in terms of yield of um, and identifying the the, the um, candidemia, the candida species. Um, we need to rule out alternative diagnoses, so careful clinical examination and other tests are super important. Um, and evaluate um, the risk of, of failure and relapse in the patient that, that's in front of you, and and source control is, is super important. Um, he suggested we avoid starting empiric antifungals in the first place for the low-hanging fruit um, indications like or non-indications like candiduria candid and candida growing in the sputum in our intensive care population. And he um, hinted at early stopping in the absence of documentation and went through his sort of flow chart of, um, of how he stops empiric antifungals. And he largely bases that on... Um, on biomarkers like beta-D-glucan. 
Um, and he also touched upon I've early oral switch to oral azoles like fluconazole and voriconazole, which has been shown to be safe in, in certain, um, uh, uh, certain types of patients after five days. So he's also the, um, the first author for this Empiricus study, which was discussed multiple times in, in different sessions across ECMID. Um, and so I just thought I'd touch briefly on that. This was a study looking at um, or evaluating the impact on mortality of empiric antifungal, early empiric antifungal therapy um, use, with microfungus using um, candida colonisation as the trigger for initiating antifungal therapy. Um, and this has been done previously before, but this was a, a, a larger multi-centre study across um, centres in France. Um, it was looking at ICU sepsis in non-neutropenic patients, so critical illness, new ICU onset of sepsis, and these patients were very sick, so they had multi-organ failure, they were heavily can, um, candida colonised, but they were non-neutropenic, non-transplant patients in that ICU cohort. Um, but the upshot was that microfungin group, although it had less um, inv proven invasive fungal infections, there was no benefit in mortality. So this was discussed in, in multiple sessions in terms of sepsis um, and what we know um, so far from empiric antifungal therapy. So other sessions, speaking of sepsis, this session, um, the year in review was an excellent summary of the advances in sepsis definitions, diagnosis and treatments. I won't go into the, what, what was discussed because it's far too much, but you can access it on ecmidlive.org. Um, it's an excellent session. Um, and there was also a, um, a late breaker um, discussion, something non-antifungal, um, but something of interest. Um, so is, is it safe to stop empiric antibiotics in high-risk febrile neutropenic patients? So this is quite topical um, in my institution, but um, so it raised some some interest um, and I quickly um, emailed a head of haematology to, to discuss um, this possibility, but um, it, it was looking at um, whether a clinical approach to stopping empiric antibiotics in, um, in these high risk patients is as safe as the standard approach. And by the standard approach, um, I mean, stopping antibiotics once neutrophil recovery has occurred. Um, and the clinical approach is really looking at whether they're fever-free for over 72 hours plus they're clinically stable. So in those patients, we commonly continue antibiotics until their um, neutrophil recovery occurs. But in this um, particular study, it was looking at stopping antibiotics at that point where they're stable and they've got a couple of maybe a week or two more of neutropenia. It's a common clinical question, I have to say. So as I said, it's a, it was a randomised controlled multi-centre open-labelled study over a couple of years. It was in adult haematology patients, um, mainly acute leukaemia patients, but also some um, stem cell transplant, mainly autologous stem cell transplant and some allogeneic transplant, so high-risk febrile neutropenic patients, and they looked at withdrawing antibiotics at that time point. And... I won't go through all of their results because it was really presented, unfortunately, in, in abstract form. Um, but um, they had, between the groups, they had similar fever duration and fever recurrence. Um, they had, and obviously in the, um, in the experimental arm, they had fewer empiric antibiotic days, but the crude mortality was similar. So some um, intermediate results so far, but we're um, hoping to have a look at the paper once it's published, and that will be um, of interest, at least in our haematology unit. That's all I wanted to go through.
Hi everyone, so my name is Courtney Arano. I'm also one of the NCAS PhD fellows that went to ECMED. Um, so I'll be talking a bit about ECMID, but I also went to the BMJ International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare in London a couple of days after as well. Uh, so I didn't go to as many antifungal things, but the first session that we went to um, was about implementing infection control and AMS interventions in your hospital. And the first talk was from Dr. Eli Perencevich about navigating the literature and what sort of evidence you need to implement your interventions in your hospital. Um, I thought this one was quite interesting. He talked about how um, when, it turn, when it comes to your interventions, it depends on the situation. So in terms of outbreaks, we tend to focus on more logic rather than evidence. And then when it comes to endemics, there is a bit more of an evidence base, but it also depends on what sort of um, interventions uh, are used. So there's things like horizontal measures, so like hand hygiene, universal gloving, and then vertical measures such as active surveillance and decolonisation. Um, when looking at um, the implementations and interventions again, uh, it also depends on what the target is. So is the target to reduce transmission, such as hand hygiene or bare below elbows, or is it to reduce infection, such as clavsy bundles or SA decolonisation? Um, and based on that, the main point he sort of wanted to point out is, based on whether it's situation or the target, um, the key point to take away from that was um, that not all interventions are easy to study. And acquisition or transmission is even harder to study and detect than it would be with infections. So most of the literature in this sort of area is going to be underpowered, potentially falsely negative, um, inaccurate, or the data itself would then rely on post-discharge infections that aren't captured within the study. So when looking at um, rating the evidence for our interventions, um, it's mostly going to be observational studies or quasi-experimental evidence, and that's maybe as good that we'll ever get. It's not going to be that higher level one sort of evidence. So then how do we appraise that evidence? Um, and he highlighted that the evidence itself is only one piece of the puzzle. Um, and yes, they might be randomised controlled tri trials, but they're not all of equal quality, and because of those gaps, that the evidence is not going to be as good. They might be systematic reviews and meta-analyses, that level one evidence, but they do include those poor quality randomised controlled trials and don't actually factor in these quasi-experimental studies that are of good quality. So it's just more um, taking with a bit of a grain of salt, per se, that we need to um, not just look at the grade methodologies like level one, that that's the be all and end all, there's good evidence out there that is of technically a lower grading. Um, and he proposed that we need this new pyramid that doesn't rely purely on evidence and data, but going into, um, I guess, factoring in our expert opinion and, and experience. Uh, another talk that um, we went to that was also quite interesting was uh, how medical overuse drives healthcare, I should say costs, and antimicrobial resistance. Um, first, the first speaker, Suri, um, highlighted that that with there are unintended consequences when we um, aim to reduce antibiotic um, prescribing in primary care. Sorry, that photo is not very clear. Um, and then another concept as well is then we make things more accessible that things are more likely to be overused. So I just found this slide really interesting that people can purchase antibiotics online from the UK without a prescription. So, um, yeah, I just, yeah, driving overuse and inappropriate use again. And another um, component of that talk was the concept of diagnostic stewardship um, and that we need expertise to um, drive this triangle that's not just about AMS and infection prevention but also potentially diagnostics as well. So rapid tests in the right moment can um, help and reduce the use of antibiotics. But again, if they're not used appropriately, um, unreflected testing could potentially increase interventions or antibiotic use and drive infection rate. 
and excessive healthcare structures can actually potentially lead to the spread of multi-drug resistant organisms and more susceptibility in over-treatment. So just another avenue for stewardship is this way of diagnostics. Um, and as well, um, there's a bit of a paradox in terms of this. We want more diagnostics to prevent, but then we could potentially, if it's not, there's not the right balance and there's not that stewardship involved, it is increasing overuse. Uh, another session, uh, this was um, New Frontiers in Reducing Surgical Site Infections. So this is an abstract that I thought was really interesting about engaging patients with surgical site infection prevention. Uh, one of our AMS clinical care standards is, is engaging patients and making sure that they're aware of why they're being treated with antibiotics. And the, the, the methodology that they used, I thought, was quite interesting. So they basically just developed a um, patient information leaflet. But the way that they did that was that they um, developed a panel of international experts in surgical site infection. And um, they developed what, nine components of perioperative care that they thought were important and that the patient should know about. And then from that, they develop those components into key actions into this information leaflet. Um, now, with that, right, from the abstract, this is what they had. But that's from what was in the abstract, there was only seven points. So I'm not sure what the nine, the total was. Or maybe they've broken that down further more. Um, I'm waiting to get um, for them to publish and see what the actual resource was. Like from the questions, they said they were quite keen to share. So that was of interest. Um, but then just other points to consider is, is this too much to ask of our patients? Um, and, but it is looking in the right direction of engaging patients as to what they should be aware of. But, yeah, is it too much to um, expect them to ask their healthcare workers, or oh, did you clean your hands, or how many times have you done this, or things like that? Um, I just thought it was um, on the right path to patient engagement um, the concept that they thought was that this patient engagement will help implement the current surgical site infection guidelines into regular practice because it's um, creating that relationship between the patient and the healthcare worker as well and that they work together for this optimised level of care. Um, the healthcare leaflet as well required further testing as to define what the optimal bundle, like it's not just this but this plus, like the health leaflet with other um, interventions um, and as well that they haven't tested what whether it's acceptable like the level of acceptability amongst healthcare workers and patients as well so there's a lot to be done but I just thought it was really interesting. Um, there was a AMS um, poster session so um, there was a couple posters that I thought I'd have, um, present or talk about today three um, two from Australia and one from Canada. This first one is from the Central Coast in New South Wales and they're pretty much just talking about now that there's a push for more electronic prescribing and health records, that um, there's more of a more opportunities for antimicrobial stewardship and this was looking at discharge prescriptions. So um, there was a large discrepancy between the antibiotic regimens prescribed on discharge in comparison to our current guideline recommendations. So um, this is only retrospective, but if we um, can get any microbial stewardship interventions at that point of discharge as well, then that's just another way that we can help reduce or optimise any microbial prescribing. Uh, another poster that was um, well received was um, the um, work from um, Dr. Triviano about delabeling um, patients with antibiotic allergies. Um, the overall summary was that they used, with the antibiotic allergy testing, they were able to delabel 91% of patients and they received safe therapy. It increased narrow spectrum usage, reduced restricted antibiotic usage, but also managed to improve antibiotic use, appropriate antibiotic use. Uh, another poster. Um, continuing with this theme of antibiotic allergies, this was a, a research from a Canadian institution and they didn't do their antibiotic allergy testing but they used a structured history which resulted in a significant reduction in the use of um, the alternate second line prophylaxis without, yeah, so without using the skin testing. So the structured history was completed by the pharmacist 
and that was then reviewed with the ID physician, so looking into the details of their supposed antibiotic allergy. And then from that, they um, achieved a reduction in the second line prophylaxis use from 82% to 57% over 35 months. So just another approach. I mean, if um, this antibiotic outlet, the skin testing was not um, economically feasible in the institution, that this was a reasonable approach as well. Um, other sessions at ECMID um, that I went to um, were all quite interesting. And as Karen said, you can all access them on ECMID Live. The bottom two, again, the update on sepsis was definitely worth um, while looking into. And the bottom one, anybody, anybody stewardship around the globe from Professor Dilip Nathwani was definitely very inspiring, interesting. Um, there, there was over 150 slides, but um, with that, um, a lot of them was highlighting lots of research and new research in AMS, all different interventions across the globe. So it's a really good overview of AMS, so definitely worth a look into. Uh, the BMJ International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare, um, I got to present two posters at, so I'll quickly just mention those. The first was um, work from NCAS, so the, the whole poster wouldn't fit on the slide, sorry, <laughs> but um, <laughs> development of a national audit tool for surgical antimicrobial pres prophylaxis prescribing. So this is the results of the pilot SNAPs. Um, so basically just saying that um, from our NAP starter, surgical prophylaxis was a common indication at the high rate of inappropriate use of 40%, and that prompted the development of the SNAPs. Um, and again, that seemed to highlight um, inappropriate use both pre- and post-operatively. The bottom of that poster would show the post-operative inappropriate rates. Um, and then that has then prompted the development of our electronic SNAPs. So in terms of impact on the far right, the SNAPs data we're still going through and the report will be out later this year, but we've got 4,057 surgical episodes from 67 Australian hospitals. So a lot of data and that report will be out to everyone soon. Uh, the other poster that I presented is part of my PhD. So I'm representing the tertiary surgical stream um, at NCAS. So I'm looking again at surgical prophylaxis, but looking at the implementability of the guidelines. So we know that we've got that 40% of inappropriate um, use and part of that is guideline non-concordant use. So we want to know that uh, well, well, part of my project is, is the implementability of the guidelines potentially one reason why we have this guideline on concordance. So guideline implementability, implementability itself is an abstract concept. Um, what, uh, there is this instrument called the GLIA instrument, so the guideline um, implementability appraisal instrument. It has 30 questions um, pertaining to implementability. And then from that, the responders would complete a yes, no, or not applicable um, answer to these questions. And if it's a general consensus of no, it would imply that that component is a barrier to the implementation of this guideline. Um, this project hasn't been completed. It's, been, um, it's underway at the moment. And we've got about 12 experts in infection control, infectious diseases, stewardship and surgery completing this appraisal. Um, what we want from this is to ideally identify these um, barriers and also enablers of guideline implementation and that will then inform future um, guideline development. We have lots of guidelines out there in general not pertaining to antibiotics and um, one thing that's come up in the literature is that the guidelines, if they don't have the resources or a toolkit to help implement them, then that greatly impacts upon their uptake into services. So that could be something that could come out from this research. Um, then the forum in general, um, just some, some points that I took away from the conference. Um, the first talk was about achieving large-scale behaviour change. There was a big talk about culture and behaviour change at this conference and one um, little uh, uh, acronym uh, I really liked was EAST. So with um, all any intervention or quality improvement intervention, and you can apply this to antimicrobial stewardship, 
is that they should be east. They need to be easy, attractive, social and timely. So in terms of think, making things easier or more attractive, we need to have open communication across um, all healthcare workers. Um, and um, uh, by making them easy in terms of standardised approaches or um, standardised operating procedures, so giving permission for staff to act upon the interventions that we want. Um, it's important for our healthcare workers or like at all levels to see that our actions do have meaning. They want to see the change. It's one thing to say, oh, we've got improvements, but they want to know about it. So one thing is to make them more visual. Um, so um, one example that they did was um, they talked about plotting the dots. So they had um, on the wards of the, like where they had their interventions, um, like month to month changes or the nursing staff were actively involved in plotting the dots and um, taking part in sharing the data amongst the ward and it promoted local ownership of their um, initiatives. Um, and that sort of made it so increased awareness for all staff to see the targets and goals of their quality improvement programs and made it that it was a mission of all ward staff, not just the AMS champions or like the champion nurse on the ward of that program. There was a large focus on patients and patient engagement with um, quality improvement. And the quote that I like from it was that we perform, health, perform healthcare with the patient, not for the patient. Um, so there was a focus on um, enhancing the patient experience with their healthcare, um, their relationships between receiving and delivering healthcare, and the relationships with their healthcare workers or clinicians and non-clinician staff. Um, a big focus on empowering the patient. It's very easy to disempower patients and that an empowered patient is generally a safer patient and that we should exploit that rather than reject it in, uh, when delivering healthcare. Um, and again, empowering that patient and giving them um, some sort of responsibility. So again, this is all very broad sort of tip, um, speaking in how you apply that, adopt that to your own quality improvement or AMS interventions is different. Um, and again, visualisation, they want to see the change. They want to be um, a part of that difference as well. Another key point that they talked about is that there's three elements of healthcare the head, the hand and the heart um, and that we need to also focus on this compassion element um, and provide that with our education of health professionals and delivery. Um, lastly, the opportunity to do quality improvement is a gift. It's a gift that keeps on giving and another quote I like that it's an infectious disease that can spread throughout the organisation and a big part of that is with culture. It's a gift given to patients and clients um, by empowering them, to our staff by empowering them and motivating them and to the organisation as well. The challenge of that is spreading it and that for that to happen, it has to be part of the culture for continual improvement. And then the key points overall is that for culture, we have to understand it before trying to change it. Patient empowerment is a large part of that. It can change the dynamic of healthcare. Um, those relationships that I've talked about and how we develop and implement interventions. Times changing, social movements require social media, grassroots approaches um, on the floor, constant reporting and showcasing our work amongst ourselves and um, getting that overall staff involvement. And again, and finally, that the journey of quality improvement and AMS is never ending. We're constantly looking for improvements and optimising healthcare. The main challenge is how to stay motivated to continue that and then again that links back to culture. To ensure its continuity we need a supportive culture that embraces change and moving forward. Yeah, so lots of, layers, so there's lots to talk about and thanks to NCAS for supporting the journey that I had over there and yeah, all good. Thanks Courtney, thanks Karen. I have to give a talk yesterday about workforce capacity building and health services translation and um, and I explained to the audience that antimicrobial stewards are health services researchers by definition <laughs> and we make very good health services research because we have to do with all those things on a daily basis. So thanks everyone.
in the sun. Which is pretty impressive. Sorry, I'll just press. Well, I press pause. Thank <laughs> you. 